success. We just completed our drive-by of the Neptune statue in Virginia Beach, Virginia, in what can be described as our parallel mission with New Horizons mission to Pluto. Our next stop, Pluto, an unincorporated township approximately 350 miles away. Welcome to the NASA Edge Galactic Getaway. You know, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union downgraded Pluto from a planet to a dwarf planet. We're gonna go figure out if the Pluto Township was downgraded too. Man, what are you doing with that map? I I'm just validating data. Do you, you know how to get there? Yeah, I have some GPS coordinates that'll get us in the region. While Blair's trying to figure out how to fold that map, I had a chance to sit down with Jim Green at NASA headquarters. He gave us some great information on the New Horizons mission and Pluto. Let's check it out. Hey dude, can you get that map out of my rear view mirror? I have to see whether or not a Star Destroyer is pulling up to my bumper. <laughs> So Jim, we have a, a cool mission that's approaching Pluto, New Horizons. How does New Horizons fit in the overall scheme of planetary science at NASA? Well, this is a really gonna be a historic moment because New Horizons will complete our initial investigation of our solar system. NASA has been to every planet in the solar system. And of course, Pluto being that one furthest away, it's taken us a long time to get there. Almost 10 years. Now it was launched back in 2007? 2006, yeah, January 2006. And it was traveling with something like 36,000 miles an hour to get there? Yeah, so when it did take off, it was at that time the fastest vehicle ever. And of course it got a swing by of Jupiter, so that increased it. And now it's moving at about 14.2 or 14.7 kilometers per second. So that's an incredible speed. Now what's unique about Pluto that's different from the other planets in the solar system? Well, Pluto represents a brand new population of objects that we know almost nothing about. Now this is way out in the outer part of our solar system. We believe this is debris left over from the initial formation of the solar system. Oh, wow. And so we're gonna be visiting that population for the very first time. Now we call that the Kuiper Belt. You know, there's maybe hundreds of thousands of objects like that out there. Right now, we've observed about 1,500 of them, but there's just a slew of them out there, and Pluto's really the archetype. It's the top dog of the group. Now, when we were both in school, we learned that Pluto was a planet. It was the yeah. ninth planet of the solar system. And True. since 2006, it's been demoted to a dwarf planet. What, what happened there? Well, you know, the International Astronomical Union is the group that decides on naming conventions. You know, and from a NASA perspective, we don't care if it's a planet or not. It is a wonderful object, well worth visiting, because it represents one of those groups that we've not visited. So you've got terrestrial planets, you've got gas giants, and then you've got this third group, Kuiper Belt objects. Okay. So, of course, Pluto is going to be our first one that we'll get to observe. So New Horizons has been on, well on its way to Pluto since 2006. During that transit time, what do we learn about Pluto? Well, what we've learned about Pluto is that it's a very complicated system. It has five moons, not just Pluto and Charon, but it has these smaller moons that's been observed by Hubble. Now, we've also had a lot of ground-based observations that continue to make occultation measurements. And that's where Pluto will move in front of a very distant star. And we wanna make those measurements because they'll tell us where the surface of Pluto is, but also if Pluto has an atmosphere. And it turns out those observations clearly indicate that Pluto has a very nice, but small atmosphere. Is it just from the gravity that it holds this material? Or is it an active body? Are there some sort of volcanoes or something for which the atmosphere gets replenished? So by flying by, we'll get a much better idea as to how active that body is and whether there's a hydrological cycle of some sort. You know, how extensive is that atmosphere? It's a top question we'd like to know. Now, why do we want to study all these new features about Pluto if it's so far away? Well, indeed, as I mentioned, this is a brand new population. We want to know much more about it. But in addition to that, we want to compare those objects to other things that we do know about, like comets or like terrestrial planets or like other moons. You know, there's one period of time in our history of the evolution of our solar system where we believe interactions between Jupiter and the other planets, there was a push and pull, a tug, if you will, 
moving around, and it rearranged our planets in their locations. In other words, the outer planets, the giant planets like Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn were formed much closer to the sun than where they are today. Oh, wow. So Jupiter's interaction pushed them out and it brought the Kuiper Belt in. So are there objects right now that are orbiting our other planets, our big planets, our gas giants, that are actually Kuiper Belt objects? We don't know that. But it tells us, once we see Pluto and once we understand much more about these bodies, how that interaction could have happened and a little bit about the history of our solar system. You know, Jim Green did a great job giving us information on the New Horizons mission and Pluto. In fact, it's pretty stunning that the spacecraft will be traveling at 14 kilometers per second as it flies by Pluto. I mean, that's kind of like going from our Neptune statue to the township of Pluto in less than 30 seconds. Man, that is a whole lot faster than what we're traveling right now. You, you better believe it. It was great information, but I'm distracted by the fact that Blair is still in my rear view space mirror with a sheet of paper and a legend. Um, the important thing is that I'm navigating. I mean, I don't think you understand that redundant systems are actually important to any mission. Are you trying to become an Eagle Scout on this trip? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to, to, to verify and check and make sure we're on course, even though it's very tricky to actually find Pluto on this map. I, I'm, I have to confess that. That's well, been well, difficult. Well, we have GPS that's going to get us into the vicinity of Pluto, but we also have other technology on board that can take readings like uh, the temperature. We have an altimeter. Uh, we have about two or three cameras less than New Horizon has on board, because you can see me here, 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 and back there too. So speaking of scientific instruments, I mean, you did mimic the same exact suite of instruments that New Horizons has on this vehicle, right? I had a slight budgetary limitation when I tried to outfit this vehicle. So I wouldn't say that I mimicked. Uh, I, in spirit, I tried to replicate some of the things. And actually, it would be near impossible for us to actually mimic what New Horizons is doing. As Alan Stern said, when we talked to him at the Applied Physics Lab, there's so much science that they're gonna be getting in this first close-up mission to Pluto that we're gonna be amazed. Alan, we're on the brink of this amazing New Horizons flyby, closest approach to Pluto. And I'm just wondering, what kind of science is NASA going to get from New Horizons leading up to and through the flyby? Well, the science that New Horizons is going to deliver is just going to be mouthwatering because we've never been to this third class of planet. We've certainly never been to the Pluto system, a planet and five moons. And we're carrying the most sophisticated battery of scientific instruments ever brought to bear on a first reconnaissance mission. We have nine cameras, two spectrometers, two plasma instruments, radio science, and a student dust counter. So we're gonna produce geologic maps, composition maps, thermal maps, topographic maps. We're gonna be searching for new satellites. We're gonna be searching for rings. We're gonna study Pluto's atmospheric composition and its escape rate. We're gonna study the temperature and pressure structure vertically through the atmosphere and a whole variety of other things. So it's, it's gonna write the textbook. And that sounds like a huge amount of information. How does this compare to what we have for the other planets in our solar system? Well, it's a smaller amount of data than we have about other planets because we've sent so many missions there. But in terms of a first mission, I'll give you a comparison. The kinds of data sets that we're obtaining at the Pluto system this summer weren't obtained at Mars until we were seven or eight missions into the exploration of Mars, almost 20 years after the first Mars mission. And the sensors that we're carrying are, of course, built with modern 21st century technology. So they're much more sophisticated than what the pioneers back in the 60s and 70s could field on those early reconnaissance missions. So the seven instruments that are on this spacecraft combined weigh less than just the camera on the Cassini Saturn orbiter. And together, all seven running at once, draw 28 watts, which is about like a night light. It's pretty impressive. Wow, I mean, that, that's an accomplishment in itself, not to mention that it's you know, a gazillion miles uh, away uh, processing <laughs> this. I, I, know, I know that's a new number, but it's It's a technical term. Yeah, well, I'm a technical guy. Um, how is that scientific data gonna help us understand our solar system better? Well, that's a great question. You know, every big planet used to be a small planet. Planets grow from small objects to successively larger objects. 
The Earth used to be Pluto's size, as an example, so did Mars. And so by going to this new class of small planets, we have a chance to study the intermediate growth stage for the larger planets. And it's going to help us connect the dots between the missions we've flown to comets and planetesimals and small things out of which small planets are built. And now we can see the intermediate sized objects like Pluto and then connect that to understanding the origin of the Earth. The one thing I'm wondering, New Horizons continues after Pluto. Are there any plans for it to get more data about Pluto or about other objects that might even be further out there? Yeah, that's a great question. We're actually going to be taking data for weeks after we make the flyby back looking at the Pluto system. Then we'll spend about a year and four months getting all that data back to the Earth. It takes a long time because there's so much data. And then following that, we hope to fly on to flybys of small building block Kuiper Belt objects, much, much smaller than Pluto, a thousand times less massive. And we have a couple of targets that we could fly by in 2019 if an extended mission is approved. And then even after that, New Horizons has the power to continue to operate into the 2030s. So it could fly a mission a lot like Voyager is flying now to explore the outer fringes of the heliosphere, maybe even to get into interstellar space. What are you most looking forward to on uh, the day, uh, when, when all the data comes back, what are you most excited about? I'm excited about a number of things. You know, scientifically, I'm excited about simply unwrapping this present under the tree. That so many people have worked so hard for a very long time to accomplish and see what's inside. What's really there at the Pluto system? How complicated is Pluto? How fascinating are its satellites? What's it all about? I'm also excited because we have a chance with New Horizons because of the nature of exploration and the nature of going to a frontier to capture people's imaginations in new ways, to excite kids about science and engineering and space flight, and uh, to show the public, both here home and abroad, the kind of things that only NASA can do. People are absolutely excited about New Horizons. And on our mission, we decided to stop by and talk to some men and women to get their views on Pluto. All right, Zach, um, what comes to mind when I mention to you the word Pluto? Uh, planet. <laughs> uh, the planet and the god. The planet. It is a planet, right? Yes. Right, isn't it? <laughs> no, no. So Pluto is a planet. Uh, yeah. To me, it's a planet. Just know it was a planet and that it was declassified as a planet. That, that's true. It now is being classified as a, a dwarf planet. So it technically kind of is a planet, just kind of a loophole in the system, maybe? Well, that's the question, and that's going to be the uh, debate that a lot of people have for many years. I mean, I grew up thinking it was a planet, so I guess I'll just continue thinking it's a planet, you know? How much larger is Pluto than the planet Earth? I thought it was smaller. I might be wrong. That was a trick question. It was a trick question, so it is smaller? Yes, absolutely. OK, all right, cool. <laughs> what is it about seeing things that you've never seen uh, in the solar system that is, that is cool? I, I mean, I think that space exploration is important. I mean, eventually we're going to get hit by an asteroid or something. That's not necessarily directly related to this, but I still think it's all very interesting. I think it's wonderful, and I think it's very important for us to understand what's going on, not only here on planet Earth, but out in space around us, and how those things can impact us ultimately. And just the sense of adventure and the exploration, I think it's wonderful. Thanks, Rebecca. Now we're going to look at an interview I did with Chris Herzman at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory about the New Horizons spacecraft. So Chris, New Horizons has been flying for like nine years. I, I can barely keep my car going. Uh, how do you develop a spacecraft that can last that long? Well, it all started in the very beginning, planning the redundancy throughout the spacecraft. There's redundancy in the thrusters, there's redundancy in the star cameras. Even the instruments, although there is one of each, some of the instruments have internal redundancy. Other instruments can back up the measurements with different types of observations. So the redundancy is what makes the spacecraft last a long time. Fortunately, so far, we haven't had to use that redundancy, but on board, the autonomy system can actually switch the redundant components automatically when it detects a problem on board. 
So based on the way that New Horizons is flying, using the Star Tracker, if it gets off, will it automatically adjust itself? Yeah, as long as the Star Tracker is locked on the stars, we tell it in a command sequence where to point, and it knows where it's pointed, and it maneuvers to that position at the time that we tell it to do. So for the encounter, it's a precisely choreographed operation, and we've actually rehearsed that in the summer of 2013 to make sure the spacecraft could do all the operations that we planned for the encounter. How long does it take to communicate with New Horizons? So when you send a signal from the ground, it takes four and a half hours for the signal to reach the spacecraft. And then if you want to hear it, you know, find out what happened, whether it received the signal or not, it takes another four and a half hours. So it's about nine hours for the signal to go up to the spacecraft and get the response down. And as it turns out with the Earth rotating, oftentimes we're receiving the signal on a different ground station from what we sent the commands to the spacecraft on. So it's fortunate that the Deep Space Network has the 70 meter antennas on the ground spaced throughout the globe so that we can get continuous coverage on the transmission and the receipt of the signal. The power source is good to run probably into the 2030s, but is there a time before that that we might not be able to communicate with New Horizons? So the power source is what would most likely be the limiting factor in communicating with the spacecraft. We designed the antennas and the communication system to have adjustable data rates. And so as you get farther away, we can lower the data rate and still communicate. So even though it's very, very far away, with the selection of the different antennas and the operations that we put the spacecraft in, we believe that we can go as long as the power source can sustain the thermal environment within the spacecraft. So from what you're saying, uh, New Horizons will be able to ride and fly longer than I'll be able to drive. <laughs> yeah, I think, I hope I'm still standing when it's, uh, <laughs> you know, reaching the end of its mission. Boy, it's about time we made it to the border of West Virginia. Yeah, man, it took us a little while, but we're here. Wait a minute, there's a West Virginia? Absolutely, Pluto, West Virginia is where we're going. Here, okay, okay, we need to make a quick stop. Why? Just trust me, we need to make a quick stop. You ever heard of Pluto, West Virginia? What is it? Have you ever heard of Pluto? I've heard of it, but I can't, I can't keep place for it with that. Do you know where Pluto, West Virginia is? Pluto? Pluto, West Virginia. Pluto. Pluto. Like the planet, I'm trying to find Pluto, West Virginia. Good luck. Uh, these, oh. No, I'm not oh, saying. This, you're, no, you're, no, this is, is for this real. Called? It's for real. Like, NASA Edge. Uh, NASA Edge, yes, but we're supposed to go to Pluto, West Virginia, and because we're doing a mission to go to Pluto, the planet, and so we were going to oh, go okay. to Pluto, West Virginia, but we can't find it. I have the wrong map. My friends are waiting you're for me. You're thanking me, aren't you? I am not. I swear to you. You are. The, you are. Yes, do I are. look like the kind of guy that, yeah. Yeah. really? I do yeah. look like the kind of guy that would punk? Maybe yeah, he does. I don't understand it. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, you all right, man? Yep. All right. Yep, here we go. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was helpful um, in the spirit of honesty and good teamsmanship. I have to say, I can't with any confidence, based on my understanding, tell us exactly how we get to uh, Pluto. Uh, West uh, Virginia. Of course. Uh, we've always had the information in our GPS and we put it in uh, before we left the uh, Neptune statue in Virginia Beach. So we've been on schedule and on course ever since we left. So let me get this straight. I'm, I wasn't a redundancy, I was irrelevant. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I got to take some blame here. I thought I really thought I could I could do it, but uh, we did get good stuff today, right? Okay, well, I mean, it's not a total loss, okay. right? No, we got great yeah, stuff. Yeah, we did. You know, when I talked to the men and women on the street, uh, you know, those that knew about Pluto and New Horizons were excited about it. And those that didn't, after we informed them about the new things that NASA's doing with this mission, they became excited. So yeah. I think all in all, it, 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 was, it was a good trip and we were able to get out good information. Speaking of New Horizons, I got a little trivia for you. Oh, all right. awesome. Uh, of course, uh, you know, Pluto was, was first invented in 1930. Invented? The Lowell, invented? Well, not invented, but discovered, I should say. Yep. It was okay. discovered. Yep. Discovered. Uh, yep. At the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Mm. Who invented? <laughs> you, got, you got me with this invented word. Who first discovered Pluto? 
Clyde Tumble. Yeah, because we weren't after in the show. Or basic science. Do you realize that, you know, Clayton Kershaw, the famous pitcher for the LA Dodgers, he sure. throws a fastball faster than New Horizons to travel in the Pluto? Right. It's fast. That was his great uncle. Awesome. Is that pretty cool? Yeah. Interesting and, and when New Horizons makes its closest approach on July 14th, that's the same day as the All-Star game. Wow. Oh, now, now, I'm just saying the planets are aligning. Okay, okay. All right. NASA did not plan that though, right? No. That was not planned. No. Because when they plan that chart and they send the spacecraft out, they, they've got the thing nailed down pretty solid. But you know if they want to, they could because they are they are that good. <laughs> yeah, they are that good. Hey, how are we doing uh, getting the Pluto? About an hour to go? Uh, we about an hour to go. We, 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 we're on schedule. We're getting there. Uh, oh, okay, so before we get there, I did want you guys to see the interview I did at the National Air and Space Museum with the author of Pluto's Secret, which is this really interesting kids' book. Let's check it out. So, David, what was the inspiration for telling Pluto's Secret as a story? Oh, once every three years, uh, I go to a meeting called the General Assembly of the International Astronomical Union, where astronomers get together to decide things about what to call planets, what to call stars, a lot of nomenclature issues. And uh, in Prague, 2006 is when they demoted Pluto, and I watched. And I was absolutely fascinated, filled with all sorts of stories about the experience, because it really was quite a bit of tension and a lot of concern. Anyway, I came back and wanted to tell everybody about it. He came back to the museum and was telling us that story and was writing an academic paper about astronomers, but he was calling it Pluto the Problem Planet. And I had a three-year-old at the time, and so I spent a lot of time reading children's stories, telling children's stories, and I just thought Pluto the Problem Planet sounds like a children's story. So as you thought about this, um, what did you think it was important to tell uh, about Pluto, particularly to kids? One of the things about telling stories to my son is in order to keep myself from going crazy, I would play around with point of view. So I could tell the same story, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, from Mama Bear's perspective or Papa Bear's perspective or Goldilocks' perspective, just to mix it up for myself. It turned out that the insight that made Pluto's secret really work was that we needed to tell the story from Pluto's perspective to turn it around and make it not about the scientists and what they were trying to figure out, but to realize Pluto's been the same the whole time. Pluto is fine with what it is. And it really was a story about the scientists trying to learn more about Pluto and then changing how they named and how they classified things. Diane, you illustrated Pluto's secret. How did you personify Pluto? Well, I decided to give Pluto a face. With children, I think that it's important for them to understand that Pluto was like a person, like they are. People didn't understand what he was all about. He was sort of different than all the other planets, and I know that there's some little kids that kind of feel the same way, that they don't really fit into the usual format of what is considered to be typical. Mm -hmm. And so Pluto is a feisty little planet, and it kind of knew what it was all about, and that's what I kind of did. What exactly is Pluto's secret? Oh, you want me to give away the answer? Uh, w without totally spoiling the book, what is Pluto's secret? Finding Pluto in 1930, at a time when we really didn't have the sustained capability to really know what's out there, it was in a way a fluke. And Pluto knew it and knew that it was king of the Kuiper Belt, or wasn't named <laughs> Kuiper Belt yet, but it was, it was part of a whole new part of the solar system that nobody realized existed and from time to time revealed its little parts of its secrets to us so that we could learn and finally realize the solar system isn't what we thought it was. Awesome, and so now uh, that you have a book, are, are there plans for uh, future uh, episodes? Of yes, Pluto? I hope so. <laughs> I mean, there are more planets out there to discover. I think that it would be great, and the thing is, when we go out and we talk to children at libraries and schools, they're really interested. It's a different way of approaching astronomy that's more child-friendly and more developmentally appropriate. It makes really hard facts and science more accessible to young children, which is what we're trying to do. What's next in terms of uh, Pluto or what New Horizons may find? Well, when we put the book together, we knew that New Horizons was on its way to Pluto and that we'd be finding out so much more about what it looked like, about its moons. 
actually, the New Horizons mission created a couple of problems for this book because when we wrote the book, Pluto had three moons. And partway through the writing of the book, they found P4, the fourth moon. And then right as the book was going to press, as I was getting frantic calls from the press saying, where's the manuscript? They found a fifth moon. And so each time we had to rewrite some of the text and even redraw some of the illustrations to make sure that we were completely current. So we're very excited about what New Horizons might continue to reveal about this little former planet that we've become so fond of. Okay guys, according to all the data we've collected, it's clear that Pluto, West Virginia is definitely an unincorporated township. Well, we came out, checked it out, wasn't a bad trip. Oh, great trip. What's next? To the Kuiper Belt and beyond. You know there's a Pluto, Texas. How much gas do we have in the tank? About a half tank. Make it so.